welcome to Auckland Formal World Museum and welcome to today's expert session. It's really fantastic to see such a good turnout. Thank you for being with us today. And I'd like to make a special welcome, of course, to you all here at Auckland Museum and also to our online audience as well. We are live streaming today's expert session, which is very exciting to the world. And so a very warm welcome to our online audience as well. Just out of interest, how many of you have been to our exhibition downstairs, Moana My Ocean? That's quite a number of you, fantastic. For those who haven't had the chance, please use this afternoon's your opportunity to pop down and check it out. It was two years in the making, and members of Auckland Museum worked with external experts, for example, Keith, and it was a really fantastic team effort to put the exhibition together. So we wanted to ensure that we could showcase some of the experts that we worked with on the exhibition through the expert session series. So a little bit of info about Keith. I know Keith has a huge following, so there'll be a number of you in the audience who know Keith well. So for Keith, he's full-time manager at the Miranda Shaw Bird Centre on the 1st of 10. As a collection, curiosity in birds very quickly led to a strong interest in ornithology. As a result, he became born again as a bird watcher. He has since hosted thousands of people at the centre and given hundreds of talks on the subject of shorebird migration. He has fostered an intense knowledge of the shorebird migration flyway and visited key sites in Australia, Alaska, China and Korea, all the while having had a front seat as the Godwit story unfolded. Keith will be sharing with us today um, information about shorebirds and why some take their epic migration flights. Each year, bar-tailed godwits migrate via the Yellow Sea to breeding grounds in Alaska before returning to New Zealand, a round trip of at least 30,000 kilometres. They, they, along with other species of shorebirds that breed on the Arctic tundra, take advantage of the rich feeding grounds available on the Firth of Thames and other harbours and estuaries. But why do they come so far? And if there is plenty of food available here, why do they always return to the Arctic? Today's session is very informal, so please do get involved. Keith has got a really fantastic slideshow he'll be going through, but really this is your opportunity to meet an expert and to get involved and to ask questions as well. Please just do wait for me to come around with my microphone um, just to ensure that we can all hear and benefit from your questions and also for our online audience as well. So please do get involved and please do um, do the questions you would like to ask. Of course, we are here at Auckland Museum. We're all about connecting our collections with our audiences. So we have a number of um, Godwit specimens from behind the scenes, especially out for you guys to see here today. So you will get an opportunity to see these at the end as well and how to learn more about this amazing species of bird. But with, without further ado, if we can please give Keith Woodley a very warm welcome. <laughs> Well, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, it's great to see um, everyone here today. Um, I'll start off with a, another question. Um, who's been to the Miranda Shorebird Centre? Okay, quite a few of you have. Some of you haven't. There's some brochures on the front table here for those who haven't. Um, just an hour down the road, so really it's, uh, it's worth, worth visiting. Now, um, if we... So for the, there we are. There's the Hauraki Golf. This is part of the uh, Moana My Ocean exhibition, and... You can see the, the wider Hauraki Gulf and the Firth of Thames down here, Miranda just about there, the Firth of Thames and its mudflats. That's the key behind um, why we're involved with the ex exhibition um, because the exhibition itself is pretty fantastic, going into deep water with all sorts of pelagic fish, you know, fish species and various other things. But really the story begins just offshore on the intertidal mudflats and that's what we'll be the birds we're talking about today will be, be you know, sort of focused on that, on that area. So migration itself, it's, um, it's quite a huge phenomenon in the natural world and it, you know, there's various definitions of it, but in essence you could say bird migration is to adjust to changes in resources. Resources like nesting opportunities and food resources may change with seasons, with time and so forth, and so birds and animals distribute themselves to take advantage of those uh, you know, when the food is available, and also when food, to, you know, get out of the way when, when food's not available, they can move somewhere else. So migration, in essence, is that sort of uh, response. 
And as you can see from here, any time of the year throughout the world, there are birds on the move. I mean, there are birds of all shapes and sizes from albatrosses down to hummingbirds that are on the move somewhere in, in the world. It's quite an astonishing uh, phenomenon. Um, the, the shorebirds we talk about belong to the shrubbery forms. Um, here in New Zealand, there's four main uh, groups of birds. We've got the oyster catchers, the stilts and avocets, and we don't get the avocets, the stilts, sandpipers, and plovers. Now, the, the god we'll be talking about a lot today is one of the, uh, the sandpiper family. And as you can see, the shorebirds themselves come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, and colour. Um, there's a tremendous variety of birds, and all of these birds can be seen. Um, most years in New Zealand, some are quite rare, but others are here abundant and common in good, in good numbers. But you can see there's quite a, quite a diversity of, of bird life there. Um, examples of shorebirds that really you wouldn't call migratory, like New, New Zealand, northern New Zealand doctoral, um, they'll be familiar to many of you, breeding around the coast of the northern North Islands. Um, after breeding, some of them might move a few kilometres, 20 kilometres maybe, to a flocking site. Uh, some will stay put, and so for these birds, they're not really, you wouldn't call them a migratory species. They find enough resources to remain in a particular area or particular region all year round. Um, a species which migrates within New Zealand, and for us at Miranda, this is a very important species, the rye bill. Um, they breed on the Braden River beds of Canterbury, the Mackenzie Basin, and they migrate north after breeding, and so you get the bulk of the world population around the Auckland region maybe 40% on the Firth of Thames, maybe in excess of 40% on the Manukau Harbour. So really the Auckland region is, is quite an important part of the, the lifestyle of this bird, but they just migrate and they, they never leave the country. And at Miranda, it's one of the, the draw cards. People come from all over the world to see rye bill, and you often see something like this, a flock of rye bill flying around, one of the stunning sort of features of Miranda that's there um, for much of the year. Another bird that migrates internally, the South Island Pied Oyster Catcher. Um, again, breeding on most of the east and south island from riverbeds up into alpine pastures all over the place. And so one of the things about shorebirds, you, when they're breeding, of course, they're in a pair, discreetly distributed somewhere. So here we've got a, a bird in the dark valley. There's Mount Hermsville in the back there. Um, this single oyster catcher, could, you know, this photograph is taken, this taken in August. Um, this oyster catcher could well be part of the same flock here at Miranda later in the year. So you get birds, birds like shorebirds tend to flock, you find big flocks, and it's one of the spectacular things about, about shorebirds. But this is the star of the show, the bar-tailed godwit. Um, you can see here quite a difference in, in sexes. The, the bird in the front, the small bird in the front is the male, the female is the larger bird at the back. Um, one of the more extreme examples of sexual dimorphism within, within the shorebirds and you can almost always tell them in the field. You can almost always determine which is a, which is a, a male and which is a female in the field. So getting back to migration, in essence you've got the tundra regions where birds like uh, goblets evolve, that's where they originate. Those tundra regions are full of life during the um, Arctic summer but during winter of course, locked down under snow and ice there is nothing there for most, most species. So most species that have taken advantage and bred up there during the spring and summer have had to get out of there, migrate, whereas middle, midway through the year, the northern summer, it's quite transformed. The tundra is ice-free or snow-free, um, 24 hours of daylight at the peak of season, a lot of water around. You've got all the ingredients for an explosion of invertebrate life, and that explosion of invertebrate life is the engine room driving this whole process. We talk about, I talk about food during this talk, when it comes to birds like godlets, it's not just food, it's abundant food available at all times to sustain the amazing lifestyle that they do. Um, and so birds that move back to the tundra to take advantage of that, that um, abundance. So there's a lot of different shorebirds breeding around the tundra regions, and you can see here all these different uh, coloured areas here are different flyways. So, you know, the entire globe is encompassed by a number of flyways, and you can see this green one is the East Asian Australian flyway, Australia, New Zealand, and you've got birds breeding all around the, the polar regions. And so that jumble there can turn up some interesting things, like you could have 
a bird like a curly sandpiper, you might have a pair of curly sandpipers breeding, two pairs breeding side by side in northern Russia. One pair might end up in Australia or New Zealand, the other pair might have, end up in Africa. So there's, there's a real sort of overlap for some species up there. Um, but we are focused more on this flyway here, and in particular the, the areas here where birds are wintering, where they're stopping during migration, and in the case of God, that's breeding up in the, the Arctic. So that's the basic um, framework for, for our birds. So you would think that if resources diminish with seasons and a bird has to move somewhere, it's easy because a bird can fly, therefore it can fly and find itself where it needs to be. I mean, it's, that's just a fairly straightforward equation. But it's not quite as simple as that because in order to do that, the birds have to evolve a whole set of strategies, tools and strategies, to enable them to do that. They can't, you know, a goblet can't just decide, just, well, I'm going to fly down to the southern hemisphere. It's got to go through a whole raft of preparations which we'll, we'll talk about here. So, and you would think that a, a bird, a goblet arriving back in, in New Zealand in September, in fact, in the next week or so, we could well start getting the first arrivals back and they keep arriving back into October. So imagine a goblet arriving back at Miranda, say, in a couple of weeks' time. It's been up to the tundra, it's gone through its breeding cycle, it's come back after this round trip, 30,000 kilometre migration. So you would think that now's the time the bird could sit down, relax, and just have a break. But these guys don't get any time off. And you look at this, up the top there, you've got where the bird is through the year. So most of, most of their life is spent in New Zealand, in, in this case. You've got the breeding there, and they're migrating through Eastern Asia there. So that's what they're doing through the year. Um, that's where they are through the year, and this is what they're doing. They're going through various molt phases, they're fueling up for migration, and they're breeding, and also migrating. So there's no gaps in that schedule. There's no time off for these birds. So those birds arrive in the next couple of weeks. After a couple of days of just recovery from the flight, they need to start preparing for the next migration. That's not going to happen until March. That's six months away. But they've got to start the preparations almost straight away. The first thing they need to do is grow a completely new set of flight feathers. Because th th that bird arriving in a couple of weeks' time, the feathers, the wing feathers, the flight feathers of that bird would have finished growing here in New Zealand maybe in December, maybe sometime in January perhaps, maybe a bit earlier. Um, since then, those feathers have carried the bird on its round trip migration. It's carried the bird in and out with every tide, because these are creatures of the tide. When the tide's out, they find their food foraging over the mudflats. When the tide's in, they need to come onto the shore. So there's a lot of flying there. And if it's a male goblet, as we shall come back to, there's all these outrageously flamboyant display flights over the tundra. So by the time the bird gets back here, those wing feathers are quite worn and frayed. So they need to be replaced. And so they grow a completely new set of flight feathers. It takes maybe up to 100 days, maybe a bit more to do that. But also it takes energy to grow those new feathers. So all the food in the mud flats of places like Miranda, on um, the Firth of Thames, the Manukau Harbour, the Kuipera, Invercargill, Christchurch, anywhere where there's an estuary around New Zealand with decent mud flats, you've generally got a few goblets. So that's the first stage. The second stage of preparation is birds moulding what we call their breeding plumage or nuptial plumage. Now here's a series of, of goblet photos of male goblets um, changing into their breeding plumage. So up here we've got a bird, uh, they look like this most of the time they're here, by the time some of them leave, they're like that, other birds leave like that, so there's variation. But you can see there's quite a transformation that goes on. Um, this generally starts happening from January onwards, and by the time the birds leave in March, most of them have got most of their plumage. They may put a bit more on later on, but most of them are ready to go before they leave. The third and most important phase is actually preparing, fueling up for that migration. And these birds, particularly goblets, um, were their favourite food source of polychaete worms in the mudflats, uh, probably 78% of their diet is that, but they don't take anything else they can find. Um, but fueling up is the important thing before that migration. Examples of some of the goblet food you might find in the mudflat, as I say, they're, they're specialised in these marine worms in particular, but they'll take anything else that they can find. Various shots, and you see some pretty substantial prey, prey not just here, but elsewhere in the flyway, there's some pretty substantial worms that these birds are finding. So before they go, they, these changes, these changes, th this weight gain is such an important part of the whole migration story. So just how fat do these birds get? <laughs> this is a bird taken at Foxwood Beat in March. Now this, 
This bird probably departed on migration within days, if not the same day this photograph was taken. This bird is good to go. It is very, very thick. That's exactly the same bird in September of the same year back at Foxman Beach. In the meantime, it's done its migration. And you can see there's quite a transformation. That's that chesty, almost concave down here. So that's, in essence, you could say that there's an essence of that migration preparation there, the same bird. Now, that's one thing. Getting super fat is one thing. But as the bird gets fat, in order to, to store all that food, to process all that food, it needs a big digestive system. So during its preparations, its digestive system is expanded to full capacity so it can store, you know, process all that food and store the, the nutrients and fat. Um, but then as the bird's getting fatter, it needs fatter leg muscles, otherwise it's going to fall over. So the leg muscles need to develop to keep the bird going. And of course, when the departure time comes, the bird's got to be able to get all that weight into the air so its flight muscles develop quite significantly as well. Now, in order to do all that sort of stuff, there's all sorts of biochemical and physiological changes that happen within the bird. For instance, it's, it's mainly fat that these birds are storing as their fuel. The fat molecules need to be transported to the working tissue, to those flight muscles. And so they change the composition of their bloodstream. They, they, they develop more red blood cells so that the thicker blood can carry the fat molecules to the working tissue. So these are the kind of changes that occur within the body of the bird prior to migration. But it doesn't just happen once in their annual cycle. They do it before they leave New Zealand. They do it before they leave the stopover in East Asia, in China in particular. And they do it before they leave the breeding grounds. So three times in 12 months, these birds are going through these amazing changes within their, within their bodies. And then when it's time to go, sometime first, second week of March onwards, they start heading out, as this departure shows here. So godwits in particular, Bartel godwits are... They've been part of our culture for a long time. They're the most numerous of the tundra birds that come here. We'll, we'll probably get about 90,000, we think, at the moment. The numbers are declining, but probably about 90,000. For a long time, they've been part of our culture. Um, for Maori, they were a bird of mystery. Because these birds were arriving in September, October. They were here right through the time when all our native birds were busy breeding. And then they leave again in March, showing no signs of having done anything. So what, what gives? So the expression, who has seen the nest of kuaka? One of those mysteries. These birds leave without having nested. Who remembers this? This will date some members of the audience. This is NAC, the precursor to Air New Zealand. They, uh, they were folded together in 1972 to form Air New Zealand. Um, the significance of this is that tail fin, the logo of NAC, is a stylized kuaka, or godlet. That, that was their logo. This is a ship, the Goblet, that was commissioned in Japan in 1976 for the Japan New Zealand run. It was, it was finally scrapped in 1996, but the MV Goblet was a, a familiar site in Auckland and Wellington and so forth. The Goblets fly, of course, part of our literary culture, Goblet Press. So, so Goblets have been part of our culture in many ways. And as a source of food, they were a source of food for Maori, of course, but these two shots taken during the Depression in the 1930s. These are all Goblets, these guys have got as are those. But in fairness, I guess during the Depression, any food source was, was a good food source, and these birds weren't protected at the time. So, um, but for a bird that was so part, much part of our culture, we knew surprisingly little about them until quite recently. We knew that they bred somewhere up in the Arctic. It wasn't only until the late 1980s, early 90s, that it became clear that our godwits are actually from Alaska. You'll find stuff published even in the last year or so still saying goblets and linking them with Siberia. 98-99% um, of our goblets are from Alaska. We knew that they wintered down here. We knew next to nothing else. So in order to track this, there's a number of, a number of projects and studies that have been done over the years. And I must confess, I'm not a scientist. I'm just getting to report all this stuff. I just get to tell the story, which is uh, quite, a, quite a cool. Metal bands, one of the standard things for studying birds. You put a metal band on the bird's leg with a number on it, you can tell something about that bird. You can tell, if you find it a few years later, you might find how old it is. If you find it somewhere else, you know where it's been, perhaps. And you get information such as this. These are all, um, all these lines represent the, the distance between you know, a bird that was banded somewhere in Australia and found somewhere else. So over a period of years, you get that sort of, that sort of information, which gives you some idea of what might be happening. But one significant band recovery 
came from a bird banded in the Pribilof Islands off, off Alaska in 1966. And it was found dead the following year in Tauranga Harbour. Now, that was the first direct link between Alaska and New Zealand for goblins. That was the first time there was a tangible link as early as the late 1960s. Another means of tracking birds has been putting lead flags on them, uh, in this case the plain white flag for New Zealand, and that can tell you quite a lot of interesting stuff as well, although it's limited, but here's a, here's a goblet with a, with a lead flag. Um, just these, these are pretty complex, but they're fairly straightforward. From, from lead flag sightings over a period of time, you can see where these birds are, are distributing themselves. You see the kind of geographical spread of, of where these birds are. Um, this cluster around, this is the Yellow Sea region here, there's China and Korea and Japan. You see this cluster here suggesting that this region must be pretty important for these birds to get this sort of cluster of sightings there. And up on the breeding grounds, this is where it became really significant. Those blue ones there have been banded in western, northwestern Australia. These are all from eastern Australia or New Zealand. And that was confirmation there's two actually populations. So the birds, the goblets that are breeding up in northern Siberia here are wintering in northwest Australia. So there is a Siberian connection, it's just it's not a New Zealand Siberian connection. The next step, and this is really a, quite a breakthrough, is putting colour bands on a bird. Now the advantage of this is you can put a band, colour band combination on a bird, you can see it in the field without having to catch it, and you can tell something about the story. And this turned up some interesting stuff. These four photos are of the same goblet taken at the same place in South Korea between the 13th and 15th of April in four consecutive years. That bird's on migration to stop over in Korea. It suggests it's on a pretty good schedule. Same two days with four consecutive years. Another more recent method of tracking them is putting geolocators on them. I, I understand this would have been touched on with Graham Taylor talking about seabirds, possibly. Um, geolocators is quite an amazing technology. A little gadget attached to a flag on the, on the leg of the bird records sunrise and sunset, and then you, you get the data back. If you can, you catch the bird back, and you can plot where the bird's been. So, so basically, recording from, from sunrise and sunset, you can record latitude and longitude. And so if you get the, down, the data you can download it, you can go back and plot over the last 12 months, every day, where was the bird every day for the last 12 months? So you can retrospectively track where they've been. But the big catch, of course, is you've got to catch the bird again to get the data. And that is not easy, as some of the people working on this project will, will testify. But it did show up some interesting stuff. Now we had, up until quite recently, the assumption was a bird would get ready for migration, and when it was ready, when the weather was right, it would get together with other birds who were in a similar state, and they'd all go. Okay? Well, we, we, we now know that birds leave on their own schedule. There are, there are goblins that leave New Zealand in early March, there are birds that leave mid-March, and there are birds that leave late March. Now, those birds always leave in that, that time period, individual birds. And it turns out that the birds leaving earliest are the ones that are breeding in southern Alaska. The birds leaving latest are the ones breeding in northern Alaska which really doesn't make sense when you first think about it. The bird that's leaving weeks later from New Zealand is going a thousand kilometres further north to breed. Why is that? Of course, to do with snow cover. The snow cover disappears from southern Alaska earlier than up here. So that told us, you know, so, so geolocators have, have, have helped to um, un unravel quite a bit about these birds. There was one bonus. When the researchers were going through the data, there was, there was a bonus. Now, if you're recording sunrise and sunset, and you get up to the high arctic where you've got 24 hours of daylight during the peak of the season, you're not going to get much in the way of difference in the day. So they're going through this, and then suddenly they come across these periods of darkness, followed by a period of daylight, followed by a period of darkness. What's going on there? Of course, you remember the geolocator is attached to a flag on the bird's upper leg. If a bird is incubating on a nest, that is not seeing any daylight. And so they found they can actually tell incubation times and nest changeovers from 30,000 kilometres away, you know, a year later. So it's quite astonishing technology. So we started to put it all together. There was, there was some people that have been sort of speculating for, for some time, you know, these birds are getting really fat. What are they doing after they leave New Zealand? And this guy, Bob Gill, was working for the US Geological Survey in Anchorage, and he started thinking, well, why are these birds getting so fat before they leave Alaska? And he started sort of looking into evidence and he put out, him and others put out a paper in 2005 suggesting 
that these birds may be leaving Alaska and arriving in New Zealand in one direct flight. Now, the case was largely almost always, almost always circumstantial. Okay, but if we go briefly through some of the, the evidence for that, first of all, physiological. Um, a lot of studies have been done on migratory birds in terms of how much fat they've got, how much energy it takes to fly a certain distance, trying to calculate the range of the bird, that sort of thing. And so, if you know how, how heavy the bird is at the start of a migration, and you know how heavy it might be at the, the end of a migration flight, you see it's got, starting off with 200 grams of fat, ending with zero grams of fat. That suggests a lot of fuel has been used. And maybe making a prediction. So it was theoretically predicted that these birds might be, might be capable of doing these long flights. Breeding condition. We know that birds need to arrive on the breeding grounds in good shape for breeding. They may not necessarily need to be in such good shape when they arrive back after breeding. So those birds arriving here in, in New Zealand in the next couple of weeks can afford to, they are pretty in poor shape when they get here. They're skinny, they're emaciated, they're exhausted. And all they've got to worry about after they arrive is starting their molt and just starting the preparations again. Okay, so there was that. Historical records, well, look at all the records through the Pacific, uh, looking at where birds, where goblets have been recorded historically and where they haven't been recorded, um, and, and there seemed to be a, a distinct pattern <laughs> down here, suggesting a further bit of evidence. Weather data, we know that birds will try and depart for certain weather conditions if they can. We certainly, certainly the case in Alaska. Um, it was found that. There's a, there's a regular series of weather patterns moving across the North Pacific at certain times of the year, August and September. And if you know the weather, the, the, the weather at the departure point here in southern Alaska, you maybe predict when you might get departures. And the way it works, here's the system that's moved across. This is the departure point here, Cape Avanoff and places around there. The system's moved across there. There's tailwinds, northerly winds. So the bird has got a tailwind that sets out now. So off they go. They get quite a good, you know, these, these systems might last for 1,000, 2,000 kilometres, which is quite a good start on your, on your migration if you can manage that. So there's, there's the, the wind, wind patterns there. However, if the system is still approaching the stopover point, the, heat, the winds are from the south, southerly winds, headwinds, no point going anywhere. So the birds will stay put. So we, we've now got to the stage where if the weather conditions over this place in Alaska are known, we can start predicting. We're going to get birds in New Zealand within, a, say, a week, eight, nine days. Banding data, getting back to colour bands, they showed quite an interesting thing. But here was a, here was a colour banded bird from October 9, 2004 in, um, at Miranda. It was seen departing on the 17th of March 2005 at 5.36pm. The, the flock had been under observation when the, bird, when the flock departed on migration. This bird was known to be in that flock. That was, it doesn't get more precise than that when, it, when you're getting it apart. The bird turned up in uh, southern Japan few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, and the time lapse suggested the bird probably didn't stop between here and Japan. It was most likely it didn't stop. Even more remarkable, this bird banded in March 2004, it was seen at Yalu Jiang Reserve in northern China, up near the North Korean border in late April. The end of August, it was on a mudflat on the coast of Alaska, 8th of October back at Miranda. So there's a bird that's been tracked halfway around the Pacific in just a few months. If you've got the odds of having three people in these three far-flung locations to get this record, I suggest the odds of winning Lotto are probably uh, great. Finally, the presence in New Zealand of... Uh, there's four species of godlets. The Hudsonian godlet is, occurs in New Zealand surprisingly frequently. One, one or two birds every other year we might have in this country. Um, it breeds across northern Canada and Alaska and it winters in South, southern South America. There's very few of any records from Eastern Australia. It's, it's, there's a couple, a couple of records from East Asia that we know about, but there's regular sightings in New Zealand. So what gives? The bird should be in South America. My theory is that it's to do with airline schedules. Now, a, a, a Hudsonian goblet might find itself with a bunch of bar-tailed goblets on a departure point in Alaska. Instead of boarding a flight with Hudsonian Airlines bound for Patagonia, it ends up on Bartow Airways and lands at Auckland. <laughs> that seems to be what happened. These birds may be coming, and almost certainly are coming, accompanied by Bartow goblets. And finally, the whole thing was sort of um, unlocked finally with, with satellite telemetry. And this is quite an amazing technology where a satellite transmitter is inserted inside the bird and programmed to be received by, by satellite. That's basically how it works. 
it started out, um, this is one of my favorite stories, this, this is a speckled ida, it's one of the, the sea ducks that breeds in, in Alaska. Um, it was a, a population in steep decline. It was, it was quite endangered. No one knew much about it. In the 1994, they started to put transmitters in these birds to try and find out more about it. For instance, where do these birds go when they leave the breeding grounds? No one had seen them. No one knew where they were. So they put these transmitters in, and unfortunately most of the transmitters failed. They expired very quickly. But um, in early 1995, a long expired transmitter for some reason came on, put out a couple of signals, and up we picked up. Uh, aroused the curiosity of the biologists who were working on this project. So they went out in a plane to try and find where the signal was coming from. The problem was the signal was coming from the middle of the sea ice in the Bering Sea. <laughs> what's what's the spectacle I are doing out there? There are all sorts of theories. So they put a plane up and they found almost all the world's population of spectacled eiders huddled around a gap in the ice in the middle of the Bering Sea. So that's where they are. Solved through this, this wonderful satellite telemetry. The scene at Rainbow Shorebird Centre, Waitangi Day 2007. Um, some people may know this guy, the, what, this is Brett Gartrell from Massey University, who was the, um, the director of the Wildlife Response Unit in the Waco Arena in Tauranga. And uh, this guy's Dan Mulcahy from Alaska, who's a world specialist in putting these transmitters in birds. So there we are, with, uh, there's a, a female goblet asleep on the table, having a transmitter inserted inside her, her abdomen. And this came to be a very famous photograph. I always wish it was a better quality photograph, but this is all we had. This is a bird called E7. Each of these birds got a leg flag, which became quite significant. Who's heard of E7? Yeah, not many of you have heard of E7. If this talk was being given in 2007 or 2008, a lot more would have probably known. Because this, this was a global media star, this bird. Um, but we all know that fame is a very fleeting thing. <laughs> Anyway, E7 took off from the mouth of Piaco River on the 1st of Thames, 17th of March 2007, and didn't land until she arrived at Yalu Jiang in China. That's 10,215 kilometres in just over seven days. By the time she got there, she was used up all that fat, and so she was ready to refuel. But when she got to Yalu Jiang, she joined some of her mates. <laughs> These are almost all bar-tailed goblets. Now, this, this site in northern China near the North Korean border, <coughs> is the single most important site in the entire flyway for our bar-tail goblets on migration. We, we estimate maybe 70, 80 percent of our birds may be stopping at this one site. There it is there, up there in the Northern Yellow Sea there. So why are sites like Yalu Jiang so important? Well, basically, they're a gas station. These birds are stopping to refuel. The Yellow Sea is the linchpin of the migration system for not just goblets, but most other water birds, shore birds that are migrating in our flyway, the bulk of them are using the Yellow Sea region to refuel on their migration. So what is it about the Yellow Sea? There's, there is or was approximately 20,000 square kilometres of, of mudflats, um, no longer because the mudflats are being um, you know, destroyed at a, at a colossal rate. But it's not just the food, the mud fats at the Yellow Sea, it's the location of the Yellow Sea because it, remember it was about 10,000 kilometres from here to there for E7, but from there to various breeding sites, maybe only a few thousand kilometres all over, all over the tundra. What that means is the birds can arrive on the breeding grounds with reserves of fuel, reserves of store, stores of fat, so that they, are, they can be ready to breed as soon as they can. So the, so the opportunity presents itself, they're ready to go. Because remember, the, the Arctic summer is a very brief season. So these birds have got to get their timing right, they've got to be there in time to get their whole breeding process underway and completed before the end of the season. So on the 1st of May, E7 has spent five weeks at Yalu Jung refueling. She took off again and fly, flew up to the YK Delta in Alaska. But this was just 7,500 kilometres. So this was just sort of a, a fairly, almost a stroll compared with the, the trip up from New Zealand. I was fortunate to spend time up there myself in 2008. This photograph was taken on, on Anzac Day of uh, 2008. And this was the camp we stayed in. Um, this is, you know, where God was going to breed. 
This was 11 days before the first birds arrived. It was 11 days after this photograph was taken, the first goblets arrived on the site. And so you look at that and you think, well, what, what can they eat when they arrive? First of all, they've got those stores to pull back on if need be. But there is some food up there that's available almost straight away. These are cranberries, these are other sort of fruits that have lain under the snow and ice since last season. So there's, there's, a, there's a little snack in the deep freeze waiting for these birds from the season before. But these things seem to be the bulk of the diet. These are crane fly larvae, um, about, about so big, quite a sizable morsel, but and a lot of different birds going for these. <coughs> There's one just there on the, on the left there. And one disappearing down the, uh, the bill of a goblet. So th th this food is available uh, as soon as the snow starts to clear. They're, they're probing around the, the edge of the vegetation where it occurs. And so there does seem to be a lot of food up there for them. Now this is the kind of tundra, this is the tundra they, they find once the snow's cleared. Um, now you may be able to see these little orange, orangey leaves here. These are bear berries. It's the colour of these leaves that are quite significant. We'll, we'll come back to. There's a male goblet in its breeding plumage. You might think, well, why those particular colours? Well, there's the bearberry leaves. That's where the bird's going to nest. And so the coloration they assume here is perfectly cryptic when they get up to the time where they're going to nest. And it really, it really does work. Believe me, it does work. Now, most of the time they're here, bar-tailed godwits are dull, grey, brownish birds. They're fairly shy and retiring. They're very wary. It's very hard to get close to them. They're very wary. Um, there's not much to recommend them, really. But when they get up to the breeding grounds, the male goblets go through a complete personality change. Far from being shy and retiring, they become flamboyant, in your face. They are just completely transformed. And they go through these amazing balletic displays, flutter jumping, it's called. They sometimes come in contact. These are males sort of, you know, scrapping. Males doing these sort of pursuit flights, these are all part of the display. It's all, it's all, it's all to do with impressing the girls. This is, this is a mating, mating display, mate selection display. And this is known as the pot belly flight. Now this, for anyone who knows anything about aerodynamics, that's an outrageous posture for any bird that's trying to fly efficiently. And that's partly the point it seems. That bird is showing it's got tons of energy. It's got energy to burn. It can fly like that. And hopefully there's a female down there somewhere who's suitably impressed. <laughs> now, this is another display that they do, they do what we call a limping flight. So a male bar tailed goblet will be circling in a, in a big circle, maybe a kilometre, maybe even two kilometres, high over the tundra, and it's calling constantly, and it goes on for hours. Now, if you want to know the, the sound of it, the best I can come up with, if you could imagine some sort of generic car alarm that goes off, and no one comes to turn it off, and it just goes on and on and on, loudly across the tundra. That's the sound of a male goblet over the tundra. Just astonishing. Then, when it comes time to nest, of course, it's anything but flamboyant. It just sits down there and completely disappears into the, into the tundra. Now, these birds, they don't, they don't flush readily. They sit tight on the nest. Um, this, this photograph is not zoomed up. This is just standing, looking down at the nest. The bird hasn't moved a feather since I've been standing there. Now we found the, the, the nest we found there um, was very close to camp, was very convenient for me. But then three days after incubation started, this was there, this is the, the, the remains of the nest. There had been a full clutch. That's the nest here, a bit of damage. What had happened? That was the cock. We believe it had been taken by an Arctic fox. Now, the assumption was that for many of these birds, because it's such a brief breeding season, they only get one go at it. If they go up there, they nest and they fail. There's no time to do a second clutch for them, depending on when they, when they nest. So for many of these birds, they only get one go. But if they nest early enough in the season, maybe they could get another go. And um, I was you know, quite disappointed to see this nest so conveniently camp, close to camp had been destroyed. But I stayed with these two birds for a while, and they re-nested. So this is a clutch of goblet eggs. Now, the thing about this, I'd watched a female the same female over an 18 day period. And in that 18 day period, this female had manufactured and laid eight eggs. Each of those eggs is approximately 11% of her body mass. So, you know, eight eggs, 11% you know, of the body mass over 18 days. Now, the, the catch is a lot of these shorebirds do lay big eggs, 
And the reason is that by the time a chick's hatched, they're fully developed. A goblet chick emerges from the egg and is walking and running straight away and starting to find its own food. Because with the exception of the oyster catchers, most of the other shorebird species don't feed the young. The young birds are precocial, they're, out, they're getting their own food almost straight away. Okay. And you think about it, that's a way of fast forwarding the process. Remember, it's a very brief breeding season. If there was a long period of, of brooding birds, you know, in, incubating and then brooding and looking after young birds, the season would be over before everything was completed. They develop very quickly. Here's a, um, a bird that you see the long legs already well developed. This bird would be maybe a week, two weeks old. Developing feathers very quickly. And then birds, birds that have finished breeding or maybe failed breeding start heading towards the coast and ready for the preparation for the, the next southward departure. So there's a, the birds pouring out of, out of the tundra over a period from August into September. This photograph taken on the uh, edge of the YK Delta in Alaska is quite interesting because these birds in the foreground are all juvenile birds. Now, this photograph was taken in August. These are, these are birds of the year. These birds would have still been in an egg, maybe late June, early July perhaps, <coughs> maybe, maybe late June. And these birds are now on the coast of Alaska getting ready for their migration south, their first migration south. And there was a bonus in this uh, photo. There's a colour band of bird from Nelson in the same, the same shot. So it's a pretty interesting photograph, this one. Meanwhile, E7 had been up on the breeding grounds attempting to breed and she had made her way down to this place called Cape Avanoff, which is, as I say, is departure central for these birds, where they start getting fat as they do. And getting ready to go. Now, those tracking devices are powered by a battery. And you don't want the battery, you don't, you don't want the battery to be too big. You, the bird's got to carry the weight, so you want the device to be as small as possible. The batteries in these devices were expected to last at least as far as the LAC, the fact that they were still going when the birds got to Alaska was a bit of a bonus. Um, no one's been able to really explain why, when E7 was getting ready to leave Alaska, her battery was still going. Now, if you look at this graph here, this is the voltage of her battery through the year. Coming into, into August, it's falling off. But by the end of August, you predict that battery is dead. But for reasons no one really knows, it was still going when she took off from Cape Avanoff and flew into the record books and into world media attention. 11,680 kilometres in just eight days and four hours. And she landed back at Piako River Mouth where she'd taken off from the previous <laughs> March. So, you know, just an astonishing. The longest known flight by any non seabird. And remember, if you look at these birds, they don't have webbed feet. These birds don't have the luxury of landing on the ocean to rest. But when, they, when they're flying over the ocean, they've got to make landfall, otherwise, they're history. So, really, it's quite a, an astonishing. But it wasn't just a flute. Now, this is a, a series of, of birds that have also been tracked. So just finishing off, though, one thing to look at is this curious story here. There was a bird that took off the same year, several weeks after E7, called E5. And even more extraordinary, the battery in that transmitter was going even longer. And so she was flying south. Now, at Miranda, every year, we have an annual Welcome to the Birds Open Day. In about October 11th, I think it is, or whatever the Sunday is around October 11th this year, we have a welcome day, welcome to the birds. E5 was predicted to arrive at Miranda on Sunday, 30 September 2007, the same day we had scheduled our open day. How good is that? <laughs> so we said, well, we've got a bird we expect to arrive from Alaska sometime today. So everyone went out, every, every, every god that was looked at very closely that day, um, no sign of E5. Later on, we check emails and find that E5 has had a better offer, and she's sitting on New Caledonia. <laughs> <laughs> there she is there. Now, soon after that, the battery failed, no more signals. The next record of E5, she was seen and photographed on the coast of Gosford, just north of Sydney, in the middle of December 2007. She didn't get back to Miranda until February 2008. By the time she got back to Miranda, she hadn't started her wind mole, which meant she wasn't going anywhere that year. So she had a gap year. She stayed with us for that, for that year. But what happened? What, why did E5 do this curious dog leg? Well, it seems to be all about weather. You go back and look at the weather data on her track, 
and it turns out that north of Hawaii she struck several days of very strong contrary winds, she couldn't avoid them, and that really would have sat with energy, but at time. Then there was very good conditions all the way down to just north of Fiji, where she would have struck a big southeasterly stream, which would have meant headwinds for the rest of the journey. Now, headwinds at the start of the journey is okay, but you have know, done a long distance cycle, for instance, the last thing you want is a headwind towards the end of your journey. You know? So the assumption is the bird made a calculation perhaps and ended up sticks on, you know, sitting on New Caledonia. Which begs a few questions. Now, we never know for sure, but there's a pretty re reliable assumption that did that bird know that New Caledonia was there? Well, it could be that she did, because if you go back and look at the track of the birds leaving New Zealand, they follow a corridor which basically straddles New Caledonia. And that she was an, she's an adult bird, she's an only adult bird, she's done the migration at least once. Okay? And these birds can live a long time. Bartel goggles can live 27, 30 years. We've got records of, of that. So, you know, they may want to develop a map. So, anyway, the other thing about this slide is the, the, this population, we'll go back, this population of birds from Siberia that are going to Australia, birds from here, pouring into the Yellow Sea. The Yellow Sea is the linchpin. Then our birds going up to Alaska. On the way back, it's just been revealed in the last couple of years, those birds are actually stopping during southbound migration. They're stopping northbound and southbound. But these birds, of course, haven't got that. So they are truly the champions. Our, our goblets are truly, truly the champions. And there she is, that global media star. So, now, there'll be questions, I presume. Well, those birds in that, in that photograph in, in Alaska in August are fully, fully grown. Um, and we generally start getting juveniles in New Zealand any time after late September and into October. And juveniles are very, they're very obvious because we've got a different spotty sort of plumage which really stands out. Um, so a goblet arriving, say, on the 3rd of Thames, late September, if it's a juvenile, a known juvenile, uh, that bird would have hatched out an egg sometime, perhaps in June, maybe early July, and already it's fully developed, and already it's flown the length of the Pacific in the migration. Um, and with bar-tailed goblets, there's a fairly good assumption, although with other shorebird species, we know it to be a fact, that when young birds leave the breeding ground for some species, the parents have gone ahead. We know with many shorebirds, young, the young birds are making their first migration unaccompanied by adults. And it could well be that bar-tailed goblets do the same. So these birds are flying their first migration for the first time, possibly without that old company, which is even more remarkable when you think about that. What is the longest stop that could go undetected by your satellite-based tracking? That was, yeah, that was fairly, fairly carefully looked at. Um, and on, on that non-stop flight back, they calculated that if the bird had stopped uh, it would have had to go a certain distance of the nearest landfall, landed, and it only had a very short space of time, maybe an hour, a couple of hours before it needed to be back up to where it was tracked the next time. Okay? And it doesn't make sense for the bird to do that, because when the bird's up cruising altitude, when they're, they're on migration, it's, it's expensive of energy to, to land and take off again unnecessarily. Besides that some of those Pacific islands have got very little way of habitat. So um, that, that, that was a very careful sort of calculation made into these satellite tracking uh, projects. It's a good question because, you know, who knows? There could be a cheating, a cheating bird somewhere. But <laughs> What's happening in China to destroy the mudflats? Um, it's, uh, unfortunately, around the Yellow Sea region of China and Korea and southern Japan, particularly China and Korea, um, there's incredible what they call what we call reclamation, but actually just basically mud, mud flat sort of development, um, and it's happening at a colossal rate. It's happening at a, a, a scale that's just mind-boggling, and it's been going on for quite some time. So, 
That is a very real issue affecting the, the future of, of migration of some of these birds, is their, their stopover habitat. We know that almost all water bird populations in this flyaway are declining, and the common link for most of them seems to be habitat loss on that migration stopover region in the LAC. So, um, yeah, massive, massive problem. I was thinking with um, Japan, you know, with the well, nuclear. Mm -hmm. you know, did that affect um, I'm not sure about these birds. But the E7 took off and flew across northern uh, Honshu, which was flying up to up to Alaska. Um, she was doing that in in, uh, in May. Uh, that happened in March. I think that that, that sort of um, nuclear accident. Um, but it, it's a good question because the, who knows what impacts have been had on the on the region of the Pacific. I know that Te Papa was interested in getting specimens of some of our uh, sort of shearwaters, mutton birds, uh, other seabirds that are up in that region. Uh, so we be interested to see what comes of that if they do get some, some specimens, whether they are uh, showing any signs of, of radioactivity. Thank you. And I think we're also in our bird um, yes, uh, unfortunately, you know, maybe one of the backbones of our economy, uh, dairying is, well don't be sat on that soapbox, but dairying, <laughs> unless it's done well, is having a colossal impact on our, on our waterways. The further Thames is, um, is degraded through sedimentation and nutrients, there are major uh, problems there. Um, so really, we've got to be dairying a lot better. That's, that, that's my own view. I'm curious, um, do some of the birds land at Miranda and then fly on to another destination such as the Chatham Islands? Um, Goblins do occur on the Chathams, even down the Auckland Islands. Uh, we think some juveniles might wander around a little bit, but adult quartail goblets are very sight faithful. Uh, we, we, you know, most birds, when they arrive on the Firth of Thames, they're adults, that, that they will stay on the Firth of Thames and they'll come and go from there. Um, the same now in the country. Most, most goblets, adults, are very sight faithful. Um, knots, on the other hand, is the second most numerous species. These are birds that breed in eastern, eastern Siberia. Um, they do move around. They move between the harbours. Um, there's records of a bird, a bandit, not on, on the Kuiper Harbour one afternoon, being up on the Firth of Thames the next morning. So we know they do move around. But goblets are incredibly sight faithful. Thank you. theory on how these enormous migrations started. They didn't wake up in Alaska one day and decide to go to the southern hemisphere. Were they no. breeding closer to the equator and climate change? What's the theory um, there, please? This is, well, I was doing the Goggles book, this is something which exercised me mightily, and I sort of talked to a lot of people. Of course, it's, it's, it's one of the great questions. Um, the non-stop, there's a number of theories. Uh, people are theorizing that uh, it may be due with immune systems, um, flying through the Pacific there, there's less exposure to pathogens and parasites, therefore the bird can suppress its immune system, saving energy that way. Um, it could be it, e it evolved in conjunction with certain weather patterns that enable to do this. Um, I, you know, when I was sort of speculating whether in fact there was, historically, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, whether there was intertidal mudflats habitat around here, for instance, which is now beneath the sea, um, and it, if that was the case, this is a short, fairly short migration. And you know, you can theorise perhaps that as, as sea levels rose, birds were forced to come further and further towards here. So maybe an ark that eventually arrived in New Zealand, maybe they found New Zealand that way. That's a you know, but it's it's just just you know theorising really. Um, it'd be great it'd be great to be able to sort of find out more about this. Because you know there must must be a, a story behind it somewhere. I might just pop in a quick question. So do they, on their great migratory route, do they, how long do they fly continuously for? And do they wait for a, an upcoming land mass to land? Or how long can they actually fly continuously well, for? Well, it seems that they know, when they take off on a migration flight, they basically seem to know where they're going. Well, clearly the adults do. And so they will just fly as long as they need to to get to that, 
to that place where you know. We know that birds do drop out for various reasons. If it, if it maybe has a lot enough weight, or maybe it strikes conditions it can't avoid, whatever. So we know that birds do drop out of migration. Um, and if they can make landfall, that's okay. But any birds dropping out mid Pacific, well, that's, that's just going to be the end of them. So, you know, I, I would suggest that when, a, when an adult bird takes off on migration, it already knows its destination because it's been there before. Thank you. We'll have one last person over this side. <coughs> I just did this to be mean to you. <laughs> Um, this is nuts. I mean, I mean, we live in God's own down here. I really think you should talk to these people and say, look, why don't you give it a shot? Winter over in New Zealand, and then you don't have to do this massive, big, long haul. All the way. I can't believe that these Alaskan worms have got it over an hour fifth of ten. Why? Well, um, there's a number of facets to that. First of all, these are birds which originate in the Tundra region. That's where, they, that's where their, their history is. Okay? That's where they originate. That's where they go to breed. They're, they're, pro, they're wired to go back to breed, take advantage of that food source. But it's a good question. If there's enough food in the mudflats here, why don't they stay here and take advantage of it? Well, the thing is, the bird needs to nest. Remember I talked about those chicks being fully developed and ready to find their own food the moment they hatch. That means you've got a nest right in the middle of where the food is. And on the tundra during the spring and summer, it's just a mass of food and all those in invertebrates around the place. Okay? Um, take, for instance, a, a goblet pair wanting to breed around the shores of the southern Manukau Harbour, which is our most important shorebird site, by the way. Um, now, if they wanted to find a territory where there was, you know, the food was actually in the intertidal area, which is covering the tide twice a day, so there's a problem there. And if they tried to nest somewhere around, you know, we've got Auckland built around Manukau Harbour. So you had, you know, 10,000 goblets all trying to breed around you know, Auckland. Um, there's, you know, probably prices are not in it. You know. So, A, they're wired to go back there, and B, the nesting opportunity, the food might be here, but the, combined with the nesting opportunity, it's not here. Maybe <laughs> That's a great question and a great answer to end on. So if we can please put our hands together and thank you. <laughs>